Please are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Good morning. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Areas Center. I want to welcome you all to our monthly MPA webinar series held in cooperation with our partners, EBM Tools Network and Open Channels. So welcome, everybody. Um, we're really pleased today to have with us Dr. Karen Richardson. Uh, Karen is the Director of Programs at the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, and she is going to be speaking on maps and data sets for blue carbon habitats in North America. And I'll introduce Karen in just a moment, but before I do that, I just want to remind you all that you will have a chance to have an online chat with Karen uh, at the end of her presentation, so please feel free to use that question box on the webinar interface. Uh, you don't need to wait until she's done presenting. You can go ahead and type in your questions as they occur to you, and we'll be uh, having a facilitated discussion at the end uh, based on all your questions. So now it's my great pleasure to welcome Karen to our webinar series today. As I mentioned, she's the Director of Programs at the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, the CEC. Um, she has loved the ocean and all things related to maps early in life and has worked around the world. She is currently uh, the manager of CEC's work on blue carbon and marine protected areas, among other responsibilities. And she has a master's and a doctoral degree from McGill University in Montreal. So welcome, Karen. Thank you very much, Lauren, and thank you, um, Noah, all of Noah, for this invitation. And thank you, everybody online. And I apologize if you had registered uh, previously in September um, and now have had to wait this long. But I'm really excited and uh, pleased and honored to talk today about our maps and data sets for blue carbon habitats in North America. As Lauren said, I'm Karen Richardson, the Director of Programs at the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And I just wanted to do a brief introduction of, uh-oh, now my screen doesn't want to work, um, of what the CEC is. Um, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, or as we call it the CEC in English, CCE in French, and CCA in Spanish, is a tri-national organization between the governments of Canada, Mexico, and the United States through which they collaborate to protect and enhance the North American environment. And the CEC was established in 1994 under a side agreement to the NAFTA Free Trade Agreement. Um, and it's funded equally by each, each of the three countries. So through this mechanism, the CEC has a cooperative work program uh, that they work together on to implement projects of trinational interest. And as Lauren said, uh, I manage one of those projects on blue carbon. And the work I'm going to present today stems from those projects. Um, Karen, so we'll, yeah. um, could you slow down just a hair? Sure, I'll slow down a lot. Okay, thank uh, you. Uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, that this work is, is done with experts from the uh, three countries' agencies from Parks Canada, Conabio, Conab, uh, Conamp, EPA, NOAA, and USGS. Um, and so it's a really it's a big joint effort between the agencies and the experts within those agencies. And the work today um, I'm going to present is got had two lead authors that were contracted by the CEC to produce uh, the maps and data sets and a report. And the lead authors were Dr. Gail Schmura of McGill University and Dr. Fred Short from the University of New Hampshire. They also had some major contributions from graduate and undergraduate students, and in particular Dante Torrio. So I just want to acknowledge um, all of that. This is, as most of our work at the CEC, a large partnership with lots of different agencies and experts. Um, so as Lauren said, we have a project, but we've had two projects. We've had an initial project in 2013 and 2014, our first blue carbon project at the CEC, which was called North America's Blue Car uh, North America's Blue Carbon Assessing the Role of Coastal Habitats in the Contents in the Continents Carbon. Sorry, and I've provided the link uh, to this. A project description if you want later on to go and look at um, all of the components of the projects I'm going to speak about today. I'm only going to talk about a small component, the mapping components of this project and the current project we are um, carrying out. Um, and so the second project which we have just started in July is a follow-on project called the North American Blue Carbon Next Steps in Science for Policy. And once again, this is in partnership with Parks Canada, CONAMP, CONABIO, EPA, NOAA, and USGS. Uh, and once again, if you want to read all about the project, um, you can follow the link there. So for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with blue carbon and for the purposes of this work, we are defining blue carbon is the carbon captured and stored in salt marshes, tidal wetlands, seagrasses, and mangroves. 
and um, you know these these habitats are distributed around North America. They cover less than 0.05% of North America's coastal area, but they account for what we now estimate between 50 to 70 of all the carbon stored in the tidal and ocean sediments. Um, so compared with mature tropical forests, and this is data that's still emerging, the current studies suggest that these habitats sequester uh, at, a, at a rate of two to four times greater than mature tropical forests. And they also store three to five times more carbon per equivalent area. So remember, there's two parts to this. The one is the sequestering, and the other part is the storing. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about how that's done. But uh, also cognitive that when they're degraded or lost, they uh, not only lose their ability to capture and store the carbon, but they also release a huge amount of carbon back into the atmosphere. And sometimes that's 8,000 years worth of, of carbon. Um, so I'm going to show you an example in mangroves of how deep that is. So just to help you visualize what that looks like, this little bit of the Bay of Funday salt marsh contains what they estimate to be 3,000 years of carbon accumulation just in that, in that muddy bank there. Um, even more visual is this piece of, of um, soil and, and dirt from that same bank, which is really what we're you know, trying, to, trying to uphold as, as a handful of blue carbon. So on February 2nd, um, which was World Wetlands Day, we released a series of reports, um, but one that I'm going to speak about in depth today, which is called North America's Blue Carbon, Assessing Seagrass, Salt Marsh, and Mangrove Distribution, and Carbon Sinks. And once again, um, these documents are all available on our website, free for download, and in all of our three official languages. Um, and so you can get them many different ways. At the end of my presentation, I've got the links to our, our main websites also. But uh, that's the direct link for this document. Um, so we're really, really excited because uh, this is the first compilation of blue carbon maps and data for the continent. And these maps have over a million features in them. Um, and they're really helping us to assess the blue car what, where blue carbon habitats are where data gaps are, because we know there's huge data gaps, and we'll get into that as I show you the maps a little bit more, um, where these habitats may need protection, and equally important, how much carbon they represent, because as we all probably know, understand that we can't calculate carbon content until we know the extent of a habitat. So it's really our first step in understanding how much carbon uh, in these habitats is stored in North America. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a second in, in getting into the maps to show you that all of this, um, all of this data is available on a, another tool that the CEC supports called the North American Environmental Atlas. And um, you can go onto the atlas and download the geospatial data that I'm going to show you today uh, in many different formats. But you can go on and you can also build your own maps. We also have um, other layers. We have up to 60 layers in the atlas that you can add um, to things like marine uh, ecoregions and also marine protected areas. And so you can go through the um, map viewer that we have. You can zoom in. You can play with the transparencies um, and build your own maps. And you can download, if you see here in different formats, shape files. Geo PDFs and MXDs, the layers uh, and a layer package, all of the layers uh, for our blue carbon um, to date. So um, you're welcome to go and do that. It's also once again free of charge. So, what did our preliminary data um, show? And I just want to reiterate, and I'll do this throughout the presentation really preliminary data. Uh, we know there are data gaps, but we feel it was important to get it out there and to have people like yourselves help us um, add to the database, verify the data. Um, did the data come with extensive metadata so you can trace the source? But we really feel like um, we know there are data gaps, but it was, you'll, as you'll see, uh, it's important to get it out there and start using it. So when we look at the preliminary data, we see that the blue carbon habitats um, occur around 48,000 kilometers squared of North America's coastline. Um, and you can see the distribution in the three countries with the U.S. having to date the most mapped and maybe the most, but we're not sure yet, blue carbon habitat. 
And I'm going to get into the division by habitats, but you can see that um, you know salt marshes and seagrasses are the majority make up the majority of that habitat. So I'm going to walk you through each of the different habitats, um, starting with seagrasses. Um, for those of you who aren't that familiar with seagrasses, seagrasses are underwater marine flowering plants that root in the sediment and produce flowers, pollen, and seeds, um, but below the surface of the ocean. And I've listed some of the main species that um, are found in North America up on top there. Um, those are the ones um, you'll find also throughout the report, and you can see where they are by bioregion. Um, they are root, being rooted in the bottom sediment. They rely on, on light that penetrates the water column for growth. Um, so it's very, it's very important that they have, uh, water clarity is very important for seagrasses. And uh, seagrass meadows are found from the intertidal zone to about 90 meters deep. And they can range um, from a very few square meters to hundreds of square kilometers. So what do we know about seagrass carbon? Well, it's estimated that seagrasses are responsible for about 15% of total carbon storage in the ocean, although they occupy a tiny bit, 0.2 of the area. Um, and so seagrasses can store up to 83 grams of carbon per square meter per year, or that's about 83,000 metric tons of carbon per square kilometer. So it's almost three times the amount stored by terrestrial forests. And they do this predominantly in subsurface sediments. So we also know that, sea, the, 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 that the health and distribution and health of seagrasses is impacted by a few stressors. Um, the first being reduced water clarity. Uh, and that's usually caused by nutrient loading, sediment loading, also aquaculture structures. Um, and it's also stressed by physical damage, dredging and filling. Um, mooring and propellers, um, and, and more recently, climate change. And so it's thought that climate change is affecting seagrasses distribution by uh, bleaching, storms, health stress, and species migration that they're moving around. Um, and a good example of the decline of, um, sea, of eelgrass or seagrass um, in Great Bay Estuary in New Hampshire from 1996 to 2013 is that in 1996 to 2004 there was a 50 percent loss if you can see here um, from 96 to 2004 50 percent of the eelgrass was lost um, that was uh, by 2013 that became 80 percent of the eelgrass loss so this is the eelgrass biomass um, and this was predominantly due to increased nitrogen pollution in the water. And it created poor water quality conditions for the eelgrass growth, but it also um, um, encouraged excessive seaweed growth. So these two things were playing uh, together to reduce the amount of seagrass um, in, in Great Bay Estuary. In this case, EPA uh, stepped in and tried to work with the wastewater treatment facilities to limit the amount of nitrogen in the wastewater. Uh, and I think it's still a challenge, but I think they're trying to reverse the trend there. Um, so what do we know about the distribution of seagrasses? Uh, we estimate that the data that we have that I'm sharing with you in the databases and we'll show you in a minute on a map is only about 50% of the continent's seagrass has been mapped. We know that many locations need a lot more mapping, but um, we know also that it's a, it's a good start, uh, the database that we have. And as you'll see, almost 60% of the documented seagrass areas are in the United States. So uh, for our seagrass data, we have three different data sets. We have in green the polygon data sets that are complete data um, mapping out the extent of the seagrasses. We have in orange line data where uh, most, most of this was a helicopter survey indicated on the shoreline where seagrasses may occur, but they just provided a line saying seagrasses occurred from X to Y. And then blue dots, harder to see on this map, um, occur all the way down the Pacific here into Mexico and up into the Canadian um, Atlantic provinces. That's just observational data that uh, we haven't used when we calculated the extent of seagrasses. So we haven't used the orange data or the blue data when we calculate the amount of seagrass uh, in North America to date. 
So if we break that down a little more and look at it, we see that um, of the mapped area, we have just over 24,000 kilometers squared of seagrasses. And um, if you look at the number of polygons, you'll note that for the U.S., 94% of the of um, that of the polygons um, are are in the U.S. and only two uh, in Mexico and four percent in Canada. So if you look though, for Canada has a lot of of line data and um, point data that then need to either be mapped um, into polygons uh, or resampled uh, or reworked if they've got if the data already exists. So we're very cognitive for, for this seagrass um, maps that it's preliminary, but it's still, as I said, very helpful um, to sow. So we, as I said, we've it's the data greatest data gap. Uh, we feel like it really is an underrepresentation, and that underrepresentation is largely due to the challenges involved in seagrass um, mapping. It's really hard because they're generally submerged to use products, remote sensing products, and other easily easy map tools uh, to map seagrasses. Um, so if we look at where these areas, the real priority areas are on a map, we can see that the Pacific Northwest area A on this map is a huge priority. Uh, the orange data again is just where we have line data. Uh, B uh, for Prince Edward, uh, at Prince Edward Island in Canada, that's all just observational data. That's just point data that somebody saw seagrass there. And uh, you also see the same trend when you go down to the Gulf of Mex uh, Gulf California in Mexico, and then all around the rest of Mexico. We also know that there's a lot of uncolored areas of the shoreline where it's largely unsurveyed. So we have a large part of North America where we really um, have not even got observational or line data. So luckily, this study was made available as the experts um, in C through the CEC sort of contemplated what we should do next. And we were fortunate enough through this ongoing new project to be able to um, point a lot of the money towards uh, filling in this gap. And so we now have three teams who are going out to map and estimate basic carbon sequestration and storage uh, in, L in these locations, mostly in British Columbia, um, along the entire coast there, in Oregon, in Puget Sound, in Washington, um, and then from Holbox to Playa del Carmen, including all of the islands in Mexico and from Playa del Carmen to Tulum, including the island of Cozumel in Mexico, too. And not only will they be looking at the geospatial extent and area of seagrasses, they're also going to measure uh, seagrass abundance uh, throughout those areas, and they're going to measure soil carbon content and bulk density in sediment cores, and they're going to measure carbon content of the seagrass tissues above and below ground. And so we're really hoping that in the next 18 months as this work uh, is carried out and then all the results are compiled that we're really going to be able to improve our knowledge of seagrass extent and also of carbon storage. Um, so that's, it, and that's an exciting next step for us. If we turn then to looking at salt marshes or tidal um, salt marshes, tidal wetlands, sorry, um, we once again, they're found from the Arctic here to the tropics on the marine coasts and areas protected from direct actions of the sea. Uh, and it's, we define salt marshes as herbaceous plants, primarily grasses, sedges, and rushes. And um, these, um, these plants are not a very diverse plant uh, community because there's very few species that have evolved sorry, to adapt uh, to tolerate both flooded and saline soils. Um, so I've listed some of the key species up there also that we're talking about um, for North America. Uh, salt marshes are situated in intertidal zones where emergent marsh vegetation is at the lowest elevations and it's subject to a tidal flooding once or twice a day. So what do we know about salt marsh carbon? Uh, well, the primary source of carbon is through the growth of marsh vegetation rather than through the deposit of, uh, through tidal floodwaters and upstream sources. And uh, carbon in salt marshes accumulates in both the above ground in the leaves and the stems and below ground in the roots and the rhizomes, tissues of, of those plants. And there's a very successful sort of translocation um, system going on where they can, these plants can move a large amount of carbon to the below ground tissue so it becomes part of the soil. 
So if you'll recall, when I started, I showed this picture of the Bay of Fundy. So once again, those little plants are moving that uh, carbon down into that muck that represents 3,000 years or estimated 3,000 years of carbon accumulation. Um, there's some general threats to salt marshes, uh, the first one being land development. It's a very easy piece of set of land to drain and then to, to develop on. Uh, they sometimes suffer from the lack of suspended sediments, a lot of excess nutrients going into the system, primarily from fertilizer or agricultural fertilizer. And then something called coastal squeeze, where <coughs> sorry, um, uh, there's a wetland loss at the seaward edge of the vegetation because of a barrier such as a wall or a road um, that's built up much higher up in the wetland, which is preventing the migration, uh, the natural migration of the marsh. Uh, so these are all things that are threatening salt marshes. Um, historically, some of you may be aware of um, some losses of some large salt marshes. This one is in Jamaica Bay, which is um, in, in New York, in New York City. And here, as early as the 16, 1654, the Dutch used the salt marsh for grazing animals. But in the 1900s, uh, it was started to be used for landfill. And if we look at the progression from 1900 to 1947, there was quite a loss of wetland due to landfill. Um, and then the development of JFK Airport started to take over, and you start to see in 1969 to present day the real loss of that wetland because of the development of the airport and the surrounding parks um, area. On maybe um, a happier note is a great success story or the promise for restoration in the Bay of Fundy, where we see um, once again the Acadian settlers from the 17th century who created dikes um, along these marshlands for agricultural lands, once again for grazing. And um, in the 1940s, the dikes broke after many centuries of being used, and that allowed the marsh to come back and reestablish itself. And so you can see the progression back to marshland from 1935 to 1979 and still into today. And this area is now a wildlife management area. Um, and it also you know, gives hope that uh, we can restore some of these diked areas. Um, so when we start to look at the distribution from our maps of salt marshes, we see that salt marshes have been mapped in all of the U.S. states and most of the Canadian provinces, with the exception of Newfoundland and parts of, of Quebec. Uh, Louisiana has twice as much area as any other state in the U.S. And in Mexico, they haven't really mapped um, salt marshes much. So only marshes in Baja California have been mapped. So I'll put the map up for a little bit and show you that um, I'm talking about Newfoundland up here. Um, it doesn't have, there, there is a data set for Newfoundland and uh, it's coming in online. It wasn't included in our data set, but there is data for that. Uh, this area of Quebec, the northern part, this whole area of James Bay and Hudson Bay hasn't been mapped. Um, and curiously, uh, we know that there's probably salt marsh up in the northern part of uh, Canada up here because the line ends at the Alaskan, um, at the Alaskan Canadian border up there, and we're sure that salt marshes go in across the border. Um, and also, if you see Mexico, look down to Mexico, nothing has been mapped there on salt marshes. So once again, we know that um, there, there uh, is an underestimate of the amount of blue carbon habitats for salt marshes out there. But uh, once again, you know, we're hoping to fill in some of these gaps as the uh, over the next few years. If we just look at the sheer amount uh, for North America, there's about thir just over 13,400 kilometers squared of um, salt marsh area mapped. And once again, the huge majority of that is in the U.S. because the U.S. has done a great job, um, what the, the great a great job mapping its blue carbon, uh, sorry, its salt marshes. Um, and the Canadian one we know is a huge underestimate, as is the Mexican one. So if we look at some of our mapping priorities there, uh, one of the easy ones is to include the Newfoundland data, if we can uh, come to an accord with them to do that, and also to start looking at how we can map Hudson and James Bay and part of Quebec, the northern low shore of the, of the St. Lawrence, and how to start incorporating or mapping the remainder of Mexico. Um, this has already been started uh, 
by Conabio, and, and thanks to the Mexican government and Conabio who've taken an interest in mapping uh, some blue carbon habitats. So we're hoping that um, over the next year and a half, too, we'll really be able to build this data set. Um, on, to my, to, on to mangroves. Um, mangrove swamps are found along the marine and estuarine coasts in the tropics and subtropics, and they sometimes co-mix with smaller areas of salt marshes. Um, and the term mangrove is applied to intertidal arboreal vegetation species and, and includes ferns um, that found in only tropical climates. Uh, and it's those plants that tolerate a salinity along the coast. Um, so once again, I've put up the primary species that we're talking about, but there's a lot of species that go under the, the, the name of, of mangroves. Um, what do we know about mangrove carbon? We know that um, mangrove soils are where the majority carbon pool is for them, and um, those soils are able to store uh, carbon for millennia. So we're talking here up to, the, I think the, the study that shows the most is 8,000 years of carbon. We recently, through the CEC, funded Boone Kaufman and his colleagues in Mexico to look at um, a mangrove in the in Mexico's Pantanos de Centla area, which is the largest wetland in the Mesoamericas. And they showed that there there's the, uh, contains the exceptionally large carbon stocks, which are among the largest uh, from any mangrove ecosystem in Earth. Um, and that work has been published by, by Boone, but also is available um, in a synopsis that I'm going to show you of, on our library. Uh, one interesting thing that his team and showed is that the losses in carbon stocks from mangrove conversion to cattle pasture, because this um, this wetland sits next to converted uh, wet uh, mangrove, sorry, this uh, mangrove sits next to a converted cattle pastures, uh, were seven times higher than those of emissions from dry forest conversion, and three times greater um, from emissions from Amazon forest to pasture conversion. So basically, the cost of cutting down mangroves and converting those to pastures is just enormous in terms of the amount of carbon that it emits. So if we then look at some of the threats to mangroves, um, so most of these uh, occur in microtidal coasts, and they're very sensitive to coastal threats. One of the most important threats are the low levels of suspended sediment and the high levels of nutrient supply, so once again, things coming into the system. And in Mexico, uh, there's also some major drivers of loss that have been associated with land use changes, so de development, um, shrimp and, and fish farming, agriculture, port infrastructure, tourism and urban development, but also hurricanes have had a major um, role in the loss of mangroves. So one thing we know is that the mangroves are our best mapped uh, eco or habitat for blue carbon, and this is really thanks to the Mexican government and Conabio, who have taken uh, a, a lot of effort and interest in mapping their mangroves. 76% uh, of what is mapped in terms of mangroves is along the Mexican coast, and the Yucatan region holds the greatest area of mangroves, equivalent to about 55% of Mexico's total. The outermost extent of mangroves in the U.S. is in Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. And so um, I'm just I'm not showing Canada deliberately because there are no mangroves there. But as you see in purple, uh, where you start to get mangroves, most uh, all all Mexican coasts have mangroves, and mangroves occur in those areas uh, in Texas, Louisiana, and then around Florida. Um, if we look at the numbers, there's about 10, uh, just over 10,000 kilometers squared of, mango, of mangroves in North America, and the majority of those are in Mexico, with a small portion uh, in the U.S. So, as I said, this is our most complete coverage, and this was done mostly using remote sensing tools and uh, forest inventories. And one of the advantages for for uh, mangroves is that mangroves are also uh, considered forest in Mexico, and so they also get considered in some of the red calculations and, and are part of the forest inventory. So there's been a huge advantage um, in terms of having good inventory data and mapping, and this has allowed them to have repeated mapping efforts to establish a historical time series so that they've really been able to access change in mangrove um, area over time. The U.S. also, because it doesn't have that much um, mangrove area, has done a great job mapping their mangroves. 
So if we look at the change in mangrove forest distribution between the years 2005 and 2010 in Mexico, uh, you can see that the blue is no change, uh, but the yellow has been gain in mangroves, which is very encouraging, um, and the red is loss. However, when we look at the sheer numbers, oh, sorry, uh, if anyone's really interested in this, Conabio has done a great job on their website, which I've put down uh, in my presentation also, um, showing the change in mangroves from 1981 to 2010, and you can go into different areas around Mexico and look at that change over time um, for all the different areas they've got data on. So if we look, though, at the area in terms of hectares changed between the years 1981 and 2005, we see that there's a net change in the negative, that we've lost uh, over 81,000 hectares. And the majority of that has been lost in the Yucatan Peninsula, um, mostly to shrimp farm, fish farm, but also to tourism and the development around Cancun and Playa del Carmen. Um, the other thing that is threatening Mexico's mangroves is sea level rise. And so if you look here from 1970, which is the red line that goes out, that was the extent of mangroves in 1970. Um, and now if you look at the yellow line, 2010, that's the current extent. And that loss represents about a kilometer, believe it or not, of mangrove loss. Um, and so no one's quite sure how this will continue as sea level rise continues. But um, that's a lot of mangrove loss um, over, over the years. Um, so before we turn it over to questions, I just wanted to also point to another little bit of this study that looked at uh, how well some of these areas were doing in terms of protection. Um, and one of the things that we have at the CEC is both the terrestrial uh, protected area database and the marine protected area database that are available, as I said, on the atlas, but also their tools that we use. Um, and so if we look at the intersection of our preliminary maps and where we know we have existing protected areas, we see that a large portion of blue carbon habitats fall within both MPAs and, and TPAs, threshold protected areas, and, and such is the case of, of in the state of Campeche in Mexico. We also see that 36 of these sites fall within the jurisdiction of just a terrestrial protected area, but not a marine protected area. So those are more some of the salt marsh areas, for instance, in, in Baja, California. But we also see that a very small portion of the key salt marshes in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick fall neither, they don't fall within an MPA or um, a TPA. So only a small portion falls, sorry, within them. Um, and this map is hard to look at on a screen. Um, and the one to the left, uh, the one with the, the blue is the salt marsh overlap, or sorry, seagrass and MPA overlap. And the one on the right is salt marsh and mangrove distributions. Um, and so you can go in at your own leisure if you want to look at the reports and look more carefully at this or do it on our atlas um, and, and play with the, the zoom. But basically to show you that there are a lot of areas that are not protected at all. And also um, the management category of protection may not afford all of these blue carbon uh, habitat areas the right amount of protection. Because as you will go through um, the MPA and TPA databases, you'll see that um, there's different of protection for all of those different areas. So this is another area that we want to keep working on. Um, so I just, before I show you some of our other resources at the CEC related to blue carbon, I just wanted to reiterate some of the take home messages from this work. Most importantly, that this is really the first continental set of maps and data, and we're super, super excited about it. But it will evolve over the next few years. We will continue to add to it. Um, hopefully, we will add our own original data from the um, present Blue Carbon project. We also know and are very cognitive of the sea grasses and salt marshes are, are um, a mapping priority because we know how incomplete they are. And this is also um, you know, a call to all of you out there to help us fill in the gaps. There's some other partner agencies that are going to be working on this for the next few years, but we're really hoping to have some kind of you know, big repository where we can uh, um, put all this data together and share them. Um, because I think it will help us a lot understand a lot more the, the potential for these coastlines. 
Um, we still have a lot of work to do understanding the blue carbon storage values for habitats, all the different habitats and in the different locations. The soil depth for a lot of these habitats isn't the same around the continent, so we can't necessarily assume a constant value. If we get a value in Mexico for mangroves, it doesn't necessarily apply to Texas. Uh, same thing for the seagrasses and salt marshes. Um, so we still know that different species and different habitats uh, will have very different potential carbon values. Um, and we're addressing some of that for our seagrasses um, through the sampling that we'll be doing this year. Uh, also, the long-term stability of carbon storage is unknown, and I showed that example of the, the mangroves, uh, the mangrove loss due to sea level rise in Mexico. Uh, and so it's another issue that we need to grapple with and try to understand. And once again, I think that there's still this need to look at protection. Um, and, and continue to work with our, our MPA and, and terrestrial protected area managers to see where we can have win-wins for blue carbon. Um, and before I turn it over to questions, I just wanted to quickly show you uh, some other resources related to blue carbon uh, that we have at the CEC. Um, and so I mentioned that there were five research projects that we funded in 2013 to 2014. And these span some interesting topics. You may not be able to see all the, the titles clearly, but um, they stem from estimation of carbon stocks from Mexico's Pantanos de Centla mangroves to the quantification of soil organic carbon in eight NERS in the United States, the quantification of carbon stocks for seagrasses in the Gulf of Mexico from the tip of Florida to Veracruz, um, blue carbon in northern marshes assessing processes, and this is an interesting one, with undisturbed, drained, and restored marshes, and the response of some soil carbon accumulation rates in marshes to sea level rise. And these were all conducted by academic experts. Uh, I'm not going to read them all, but um, once again, this is available to download in three languages on our website. Um, in 2003, we did a scoping study which really helped launch this work for the CEC and really started us thinking about how we uh, might integrate blue carbon into our work. And so although it might be a bit dated, uh, this is a first step for us and uh, a seminal document uh, just in terms of where we started from. Um, also, seminal documents and a little bit more focused on marine protected areas were two documents we did in the same era um, on scientific guidelines for designing resilient marine protected area networks in a changing climate. One, one document for scientists and the other one for uh, planners and managers. Um, and both of these reports and documents have a chapter on blue carbon and the importance of thinking about blue carbon uh, when thinking about MPAs, especially as we start thinking about resilience and climate change. Um, to, on, on that note, we have a complementary project at the CEC on marine protected areas, um, and Lauren Wenzel is the lead in the U.S. for that, um, and this is looking at strengthening management effectiveness and supporting coastal community resilience, and that's managed at the CEC by Lucy Hovidou, um, and I've put once again the link to that project uh, if you're interested in finding out more about that. Uh, in, from their preliminary meetings, they may focus on the, looking at the vulnerability of um, seagrasses. So it may become the year of the seagrasses for the CEC work, something we're extremely excited about. Um, and then the last piece that we're really uh, working on in terms of reporting is to look at how we can bring uh, carbon, blue carbon into the voluntary carbon markets. Uh, we started work in 2013-14 with Restore America's Estuaries, or RAE, looking at developing um, methodology for tidal wetland conservation. So some of you may know that RAE has already published a greenhouse gas offset methodology for tidal wetland restoration. Um, and we uh, have, are helping support them develop one for wetland conservation. So we hope that that will also be available, it will be in the next 18 months. Um, but if you're interested at least in looking at the criteria for that, that's available on our website. 
So um, just to end up at the CEC, we really try to think that we're, even though we're three countries, we're one shared environment and that, um, you know, the work that goes on in one country uh, impacts and influences and hopefully informs the work in the other two and um, that, you know, this is all a cooperative effort at a continental scale. So on that note, I think I'll turn it over to anyone who has questions, um, just to let you all know that you can email me with anything. Um, you can contact me by email, by phone, but also our main website, cec.org. You can search for blue carbon there or for marine protected areas. All of our documents are available in three languages uh, at our website slash library. All of our geospatial data uh, to download is available at the Atlas or even you can put in NA, uh, if you uh, want to shortcut it, you can put in NA for North American Atlas. And a lot of our historical work on uh, marine protected areas, marine eco-regions, um, species of common conservation concern in the marine realm is available at cec.org slash NAMPAN for North American Marine Protected Area Network. So on that note, I thank you all for being very patient through this and, um, and hope that, um, you know, if you do have data, uh, you will signal to us and, and share. Um, and uh, over the next 18 months, you can all contribute to improving these products um, and helping us move forward with this huge, important effort. So thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. That was a great overview of some really terrific work by the CEC. Um, so we do have some questions, and I thought I'd start with a, a pretty fundamental one from uh, Dean Gash, who asks, can you talk about uh, terminology? What's the difference between carbon storage and carbon sequestration? So, oh, so just go ahead. Or, uh, so carbon sequestration is the, um, uh, is the carbon that, uh, through photosynthesis, mostly the plants um, absorb and then stored is mostly in these habitats stored in the sediments and the roots and the rhizomes and in the soils. So it's actually stored. It's not, it's the capture versus storage part. So captured through the process of photosynthesis and then stored below um, and mostly in those uh, sediments, but also stored in biomass above okay. and below. All right, great. And now we have a couple of questions about other types of habitats. Uh, there's a question about, um, does freshwater have carbon habitats, like in the Great Lakes? Good question. And uh, that's something that we've been uh, pondering also as a group of, you know, whether or not we include the Great, Great Lakes. So from what I understand, and I am not a wetlands ecologist by any realm, that, um, you know, there is some. And, and um, the, one of the problems there is that it gets released a lot easier. It's not, there has to be 18 parts per million salinity. Um, levels for it to be stored the same way we're calculating it for blue carbon habitats. Um, and someone on the, hopefully on the webinar, is knows more about the Great Lakes ecosystems. But for the time being, uh, we haven't moved to fresh water in consideration, mostly because it's not being stored the same way. Um, and in fact, it gets emitted a lot easier um, when, 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 when those wetlands are drained or dried as methane. OK. And another question about a different habitat. Are you looking at or plan to look at kelp habitat? Yeah, so once again, I think the studies have shown that there's not a lot of carbon being stored in, um, in, in kelp. But, but I'm not, once again, I'm not a, a kelp uh, biologist. Having said that, I think with kelp and with coral, the, it's a negligible amount when we compare it to salt marshes, seagrasses, and mangroves. And so for the purposes of our work, we're just staying there. But I know that there are some scientists who are working on looking at um, you know, the contribution of corals and kelp um, and other seaweeds. OK. And I know a couple of folks have asked, and I just want to make uh, clear, we are going to have this presentation available and posted on the NTA Center website, and we'll also have the recording available at Open Channel. So if you didn't hear the whole thing or you want to share it with others, it will be available there. So um, now switching to geography, there were a couple of questions about coverage in the Caribbean and whether this project is or intends to include the Caribbean um, or if you're working with partners there who are doing similar work. 
So we would love to. Um, our mandate at the CEC is strictly North American, um, Canada, U.S., and Mexico. Uh, that said, um, when we we do get data, we 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 do keep it um, in another in another data set that we don't usually publish with our North American data. Uh, we don't have access right now to good Caribbean data. If anyone does. Um, we, you know, as I say, Conavio has a very extensive database for Mexico and may have some more uh, Caribbean. They work a lot more with those partners uh, closer to, to Mexico, um, but we don't. We are, are strictly, our mandate is strictly North American. Having said that, I know that there's a few efforts to start discussing developing um, more global data sharing for blue carbon, and um, you know, this may be an instance where if this if some of the efforts being discussed get underway to share data, this may be a good uh, a good data set to start sharing the maps and the geospatial data related to um, to the maps and and start to include the Caribbean. Okay, great. Um, here's a question asking: Are restored seagrasses, marshes, and mangroves as effective at storing carbon as uh, you know undisturbed areas? So that's a question um, that uh, Gail started to address too in her, She, if you want to look at her synopses, um, which is on our web, she looked at undisturbed um, and dis restored um, wetlands and uh, sort of salt marshes and showed that there's great potential in the carbon sequestration and storage for restored salt marshes. So she looked in Maine and in the Bay of Funda area, um, and I will point you to that study where if you want to see all of the, the data and information, I think there's great potential for restoration there. Um, there's also, from the work that we did on seagrasses, uh, they've shown this around Tampa and Florida, but also for the whole Gulf of Mexico there, there's great potential for the restoration of seagrasses um, for the, in terms of carbon, uh, both in terms of sequestration and storage. So I think we know that there's success stories out there and we just have to also start to work uh, on, on measuring these as we restore those kinds of habitats. And just speaking about restoration or increases in habitat, you noted some of the mangrove areas increasing in Mexico. Do you know what that's attributed to? That's a very active restoration program by the government of Mexico, where they've gone into areas and, and actively planted mangroves. Um, you know, as they've lost mangroves, they've also realized they've lost all that ecosystem function, the fisheries, nurseries, you know, wave attenuation, all those things. And so they have actively had a very um, large mangrove restoration program. Okay. Um, Karen, you mentioned ecosystem function. There are a couple of questions about ecosystem services. And of course, you know, carbon storage is an ecosystem service. And uh, there's just a question about um, are, are people uh, looking at how to value the economic uh, benefit or value of carbon storage associated with these habitats? Right, so that's, that gets back to um, this, this development of a methodology uh, to bring blue carbon uh, to the voluntary carbon market. And so one of the things that they're developing, and this is uh, the Ray experts um, in partnership with, with several other experts, is you know how to start looking at those projects so that you can have a valuation and you can bring blue carbon projects to the carbon market with a valuation uh, for that. One of the issues um, that they are looking at and they addressed in some of the restoration work, which is already a published and verified um, uh, just recently, actually, uh, methodology in the VCS, if you want to go and look in the VCS, the Voluntary Carbon Standard or Verified Carbon Standard Registry, sorry, um, is the permanency. And so you have to show permanency. And this is a bit of a challenge for some of our blue carbon uh, habitats which face sea level rise. And so um, in doing the valuation and all that, they're working hard to look at how you can assure a 100-year permanency for some of these projects. But yes, there's a lot of interest in bringing these types of projects um, to valuing them, looking at the carbon there, and then offsetting it through some kind of market mechanism. So a related question, uh, Mary Edgar had asked, where will the funding come from to protect and restore the blue carbon habitat? And you've mentioned a couple of options uh, through the voluntary carbon, verified carbon standard and also uh, through restoration programs funded by governments. Has there been other discussion about other 
funding mechanisms to protect and restore blue carbon? Well, I think that there's the Blue Carbon Initiative, which is a large global initiative around the world, and there they've got projects through partner agencies, Conservation International, IUCN, um, you know, to look at how to integrate blue carbon into conservation and to have it as one of the, you know, one of the um, one of the considerations when they're looking at conserving marine and, and terrestrial or you know coastal areas um, and so I think that there's a, a huge new awareness about blue carbon and blue carbon conservation as you know as part of a suite of things that need to be considered when you're looking at coastal conservation uh, I also think that uh, you know through the market mechanisms that's a way but um, you know through our, our partnerships as you say through the governments through legislation and policy one of the things we're doing in our new project, our new blue carbon project that we hope to share, um, you know, within the next year with everybody is a, a policy analysis of those policies, laws, regulations that exist already in Canada and Mexico. And uh, this is, study has already been done in the U.S. by uh, one of the blue carbon lead scientists, Noah Ariana Sutton Greer. Um, uh, and, and, and a team with, with Ariana, uh, looking at the policies already in place where you could easily include the notion of blue carbon with not having to change laws, policies, regulations. And so that we can start to already have those win-win situations when something's being protected for some other reason or restored, or start to consider the blue carbon value. Um, and so we hope to have this policy piece and then integrate it for the three countries and start to see if we can have a bigger dialogue of, of um, incorporating it. Also, some of you may or may not be aware that in the IPCC uh, supplement of 2013, the notion of uh, incorporating wetlands in particular these kinds um, has been included. And so I think uh, as governments look to solutions after the Paris Climate Change Accord, um, you know, blue carbon habitats like forest um, ecosystems are going to be, you know, part of the discussion and hopefully part of the solution. Great. Obviously, there's a lot happening on the policy front with blue carbon, as well as on the mapping and science front. One other comment, just on the policy from Bill O'Byrne, wondering, has there been any discussion about um, tax credits for private property owners who protect or don't disturb blue carbon habitats? Are you aware of anything along those lines? I'm not, but I do think that when um, when Ray is able to get out this methodology, it's going to help us a lot think about how those blue carbon projects could be valued in the market. So even though they're doing one for the VCS, I think that just having that methodology will allow people to start thinking about what what needs to be in a project to be able to um, you know bring it to some kind of either tax credit or other kind of market-based instrument. Okay, we have a couple of questions here about how we measure carbon. Um, one question from Mariana Waller asks um, that she understands that there are different habitats and species have different potential carbon storage values, but is there also differences in carbon values within the same habitat but in different patches? So sort of even within the same area might there be differences? Right, and that's something that, um, you know, people are still, there, so there's not a lot of sampling that's gone along, uh, gone, gone on, and so a USGS has the lead on a large science project right now where they have sentinel sites around the U.S. where they're looking at the carbon study, um, the carbon measurements in, uh, within and between the sentinel sites, and the, the, the lead PA for that is Lisa, Lisa Marie Windemeyer Myers at USGS in Menlo Park. Um, um, and so, and with a huge team of experts around the U.S., a big team of scientists are working on that. Uh, within our own sampling regimes that we're going to carry out, we will be looking at that sampling um, within a particular area and looking at differentiates of sampling. But this once again gets to a real dearth of, of information and, and um, of sampling. Um, you know, around North America and around the world. And so, I'll, if anyone. It's really interested in the methodologies of even how to sample. Conservation International, through uh, this Blue Carbon Initiative, has spearheaded a Blue Carbon Manual. Uh, I think that's what it's called that um, you can find, which actually is just uh, a very comprehensive methodology of the how-to, how to measure, how deep, what kind of equipment to use, um, and what to do with those different samples, and looking at radioisotopes, and you know, walking people through what, how to standardize um, the, the measurements. 
one of the things that we're going to do in the next six months with the teams that we have is also discuss and, and, and hopefully adhere to a standard protocol and methodology, um, not that they can measure seagrasses in all of the three countries the same way, but at least some common standards and understandings of definitions. And so we start to harmonize, uh, at least between um, North, the North American countries, how we measure and map um, blue carbon. Well, you've actually touched on the next question, which was from Christine Hodgson, who asked, uh, what method is considered to be the best way to map seagrasses, particularly in subtitle meadows? Is there a sort of best practice for mapping seagrass? I, Christina, you know I'm not an expert at all, but um, and I think um, what will happen as, as on our side at the CEC, we'll be able to at least share our, uh, you know, best practices or do's and don'ts after we finish this field season coming up, where we have, as I say, these three teams out there, and they're all using different approaches. Um, the Mexican team has a, an echolocator um, that they're going to use, uh, much more sophisticated. They're going to use a boat and do the entire coastline from Playa del Carmen all the way down to Xi'an Khan if they can, um, and, and they're going to go into all those little inlets and try to map seagrasses there. They're going to use some extrapolation, um, some math methods also, uh, some algorithms to run on the, on the northwest Pacific coast, uh, go out and sample some areas and look at how you might extrapolate um, and do some ground truthing there. And then there's going to be some good old getting wet and pulling up sediment cores and um, you know sending them off. So this is something where I really hope in a year's time we can report back on um, you know things that worked well um, and things that didn't and uh, be able to to share some real lessons learned. And again, with seagrasses and mapping, um, there was a question about deeper water seagrasses and whether they're included in this effort, or whether the, how, how far out do you measure the seagrasses? So once again, um, that's going to depend on the site. Um, the, uh, so in, in our initial work, it's mostly going to be close to shore and, and not very deep. There's also uh, seagrasses that occur on rocky shorelines. Um, you know, there's some seagrasses and then it's a different species that occur there. And for this first instance, we're really not focusing on them, but we recognize that there is a need eventually to start incorporating those both species um, and, and habitats. Um, you know, I think we have such, once again, a lack of information on seagrasses that uh, are right on shore or near shore, sorry, that, um, you know, we're going to start there. Um, and I see that, uh, that uh, there is another question about geography, just wondering, since it is within the U.S., if there is information included here on the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Good question. Um, there's not, um, and so once again, uh, we when we do get data for Puerto Rico and, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, we try to include it. Um, I don't think in their compilation they were tasked with that. I think, uh, you know, we, we always we treat at least the 50 states, um, and we don't have a complete data set for Hawaii either. Uh, this is something that we're working on, and um, as I'd like to say, stay tuned. Okay. And you have a, a comment from Beatriz Zavares, who says, thanks for a very interesting presentation in Pro Natura Noroeste, Mexico. We will use this information for climate change diagnosis to identify action opportunities. And she's asking if you also have information on sea level rise threats that goes along with some of the Atlas information you presented. Right, we uh, we don't necessarily, but once again, we had a study that we funded, uh, and went, and it's in in Spanish and English and in French, uh, in our synopses of of some of the science that we funded last year, where uh, Matt Kieran uh, looked at the impact of sea level rise on a huge. He so he had a lot of of the sea level rise predictions. We haven't yet converted that over to a geospatial um, layer. I'm not quite sure if we ever will, but um, it's quite a lot of work. But uh, at least it's worth going to read the results from his study when he looked at the impacts of soil carbon um, on, and sea level rise. Or sea level rise on soil carbon, sorry. Okay, and, and this seems like a good last question here from Mariana Walter. I know, Karen, that you said we needed to do some more work to really look at the protection issue, but Mariana asked, how well represented are the three ecosystems in terms of protection in North America? That's a million dollar question because um, I guess it just depends on the level of protection afforded. And so uh, we actually have someone now who's updating our marine protected area database. And as you may be aware, um, you know, the U.S. has recently 
the U.S. has recently added IUCN categories to it, so we have not undertaken a com comprehensive look at the level of protection and the blue carbon habitat. Uh, all of the data is there, and um, if we can find an, uh, a student who we can supervise to do that through either of these projects, we welcome it. Um, we've done a preliminary, uh, a, a preliminary look, but I, I would hesitate to say the percentage because it's a multi-facet question with, um, you know, what do you consider protected, what, um, what do you consider the extent of blue carbon habitat. So um, it's something that we're very keen to work on, especially because we do have an MPA project that will, to some degree, look at vulnerability of seagrasses. So once again, I hate to keep saying stay tuned, but, um, you know, uh, over the next couple of years, this work is continuing, and we will continue to update all of our documents and our and our work, and maybe um, have that kind of analysis. It would be super cool to have, uh, and something that wouldn't take a lot of work, but that would just take some thought with our MPA managers. All right. Well, Karen, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I think this was a great discussion, and I think uh, obviously a lot of interest from the group. And I want to thank everybody who tuned in and also EBM Tools and Open Channels. And if you want to go back and, and listen to it again or refer to the slides, they will be posted at the marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov website and also at Open Channels. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lauren.